Thank you very much. Okay. As we prepare to begin, let's do so in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. On this Saturday, which the Universal Church dedicates to Mary, our Mother, together let's pray, Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. O Mary, conceived without sin, pray for us who have recourse to thee. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Well, as I told you last evening, we are going to be talking uh, about a, a topic this weekend that uh, I think it's uh, very timely, very relevant, uh, very necessary for us in the Catholic Church to talk about. Uh, we've lost a lot of people out of the Catholic Church. A lot of people have left in my lifetime. Um, let's say in the last half century, we have seen, now the, the church in, has gained members worldwide. Um, but in our, uh, in our sector of the battle space, as we might say in military terms, uh, we, we've lost ground in North America. Uh, when I was young, 75-80% of Catholics uh, in this area would go to Mass on Sunday. That's down to about 20 percent, according to a lot of the uh, statistics we've seen. There's been a, uh, a defection. Many, many people have left. We've, we've had the same thing happen in the priesthood. Religious life. Um, they've left. We don't have the numbers of priests that we used to have. And I told you last night, by the way, there's not a vocations crisis. That is a misconception. There is no vocations crisis. God continues to call men to the priesthood without any question. But he will not place his beloved sons in a situation where they're in danger not only of losing their vocation, but losing their faith. And in the last several decades, that's happened. That's happened. As I said last evening several times, and I'll say it several more today, if you want to prosper in the church, if you want vocations to increase, and they can, they're there, waiting to happen, God's calling them. If you want vocations in your diocese, if you want vocations in your parish, if you want vocations in your family, do things right. Don't do things wrong. Be faithful. Don't play fast and loose with the doctrine of the faith. Don't send seminarians to questionable seminaries where professors have dissident ideas. That will not help the vocation situation. That'll make it worse. So, in many areas, do it right in your parish. Do it right and the parish will prosper. Do it wrong, the parish will die. A miserable death. And that's happened. That's happened many, many times. I've preached in more than a hundred dioceses, traveled, traveled more than a million miles in the last 10 years preaching. I've seen a wide cross-section of the church in North America where things are done in accordance with the mind of the church, the church flourishes. Where things are done not in accordance with the mind of the church, it dies. That is an absolute guarantee. That's an axiom. That's a principle in the spiritual life. Be faithful, live. Be unfaithful, die. 
It's very simple. That's what you call in your face truth, and you can't get away from it. But we talked last evening about a lot of the reasons why people leave the Catholic Church. And, and there are all kinds of excuses, and, and sometimes I sympathize with it. You know, people get caught in bad spots. Um, they can scarcely recognize their religion in some places. Uh, I, I've, I've seen, in one case, a, a major archdiocese, magnificent, expensive cathedral, and there's a big argument about, you know, well, the people don't like it. And, well, some of them do, but a lot of them don't. And I sent some people down there. I said, what, what's the big, what's the big uh, argument about? I said, go to Mass on Sunday. And then, you know, report back to me. It, it was, uh, I sent out a long-range reconnaissance patrol. <laughs> and they came back, and I said, well, what do you think? Just your, as, as, you know, lifelong Catholics, what was your, just your natural impression of it? Well, they said we, uh, you know, they had a magnificent band, an orchestra, um, but we didn't feel like we had gone to Mass and we didn't feel like we had prayed. It was quite a production. But there was never a moment's silence nor a moment's rest. Frenetic activity from beginning to even during the consecration, the band played on. And of course that's not allowed. That's against the liturgical norm. But they don't care, you see. They don't care about the liturgical norms. They make up their own as they go along. Uh, it was kind of... Uh, synthesized when a document came out from the Vatican which addressed a lot of the abuses. A major archdiocese was asked, well, uh, what do you plan to do about this document? You know, what do you think about it? And their, re their formal response was DOA, dead on arrival. That's what that, that document from the Vatican is here. We won't pay any attention to that. And they did as they dawn well pleased, which in many cases was acting not in accord with the mind of the church, but making up their own religion as they go along. And by the way, that's the problem in many cases. Uh, people say, I scarcely recognize my religion anymore. That's because it's not your religion. It's another one that they've concocted in many cases. But not to worry. Not to worry. That can't prevail. If it doesn't have the true and the good in it, in other words, if it's not authentic, not going to last. And it's not. Things are getting much, much better. Uh, looking at the last 30, 40 years of the church, there's, there's an improvement. The, the worst is past, I believe. Things are getting much better. Uh, in my travels, all the seminarians that I'm seeing are excellent. And that means you're going to have more and more excellent priests. So that, that's a real sign of hope. So be encouraged. Uh, don't be discouraged. You know, I know there are still situations and things that are discouraging. They're not what they ought to be. But those things are passing away. Those things can't last. They never do. Things are getting better and better and better. The church is getting stronger and stronger. The battle's not over. We still have to fight the good fight. But that's encouraging news. Every place I go, uh, whether there's, it's a so-called liberal diocese or a conservative diocese, <laughs> the seminarians seem to be all the same. Good. Very, very good. And so, keep praying. All right, last night we talked about why people leave the church. Now, I guess this, you could say, why we ought to stay. You know, we talk about reasons people leave. Most of them are not good reasons. Most of them are, are excuses. 
sometimes uh, people have uh, legitimate um, arguments, but they, they can always be answered. I'm going to talk about why we ought to stay this time. You know, what we have in the Catholic Church. Quite honestly, if you, if you take an intellectually honest person and they leave the church, it's because they don't know what they have. We would never leave the Catholic Church if we knew what we had. The problem is the vast majority of Catholics don't know what they have. They don't know their faith. Even among so-called very good Catholics, you know, I did this at the beginning of my ministry 15 years ago. Every time I did a parish mission or conference, I gave a little quiz at the end, 10 questions. You know what the average grade was? And, and remember, they're pretty good Catholics that come to events. They're not the run-of-the-mill Catholics that aren't going to church. The average grade was 42%. Now that's a failing grade no matter how you look at it. It really is. And I didn't ask hard questions. We assume a lot. I, whenever I say that word to this very day, I think about my high school chemistry professor, Mr. James Stiles. He, uh, he was old school, like me, long before me. First day of class, he came in and he, he wrote his name on the board. And then he wrote the word assume on the blackboard. And he glared out at us and he said, never assume. Never assume. For if you assume, you will make an ASS out of you and me. Never assume. And that's a good point. We assume a lot of things. And the assumptions aren't always correct. I, I, I'll, I'll bet you assume you know your faith real well. I'll bet I can prove you don't. Just like that. I'll give you a little 10 question quiz. Let me tell you something. I don't care what the discipline is. Mathematics, language, history. You have to be held accountable. In education, Students have to be held accountable. You, you have to have outcome-based education or you end up with no education whatsoever. If I'm teaching whatever, whatever it is, fifth grade arithmetic or, or fifth grade religious education, uh, I, I'm responsible or ought to be responsible for teaching a certain amount of information. Okay? Whatever that curriculum is, I teach it. The student's job is to learn it. Now, how, you, how do you know if the student's got it? You test them. And there's no way around that. No way around that. So if I test you on fifth grade religious education, most of you will flunk. Well, but you assume you know it, but I bet you don't. Okay, here we go. <laughs> what are the Ten Commandments? Now that's an easy one. That's rudimentary Christianity. You know, that kindergarten. What are the Ten Commandments? Now, if I came around, I, this microphone moves. I could take this microphone, come down, and just look for a guilty face. <laughs> and it wouldn't take me long to find one. And I stopped in front of you and say, okay, what are the Ten Commandments? And you may be a pillar of your parish. You may go to church every day. But I'll bet you a bunch of you don't even know what the Ten Commandments are. You assume that you do. Don't assume. Don't assume. You got to know it. Undertake a basic study of the basic doctrine of the faith. My catechism series this year celebrates its 10th anniversary. 10 years ago this year, I, I did that for a bishop on the West Coast. Um, happily, we had the foresight to videotape it professionally, and it's gone all over the world. 
It's gone to over 130 countries all over the world. It's been on television on prime time for 10 years this year. Believe me, the Pope and many of the cardinals know about that because it's the only thing of its kind in the world to this day. Years after it was done, there's never been another one like it. Why did we do that? To help you know what you have. You're not leaving the faith and neither are people close to you going to leave the faith if you know what you have. And when I say know what you have, I'm just not just talking about head knowledge. Oh, it's got to go in through the intellect, but then it's got to go into the heart. It's got to be in your soul. It's got to become part of you. It's no longer I who live, St. Paul said but Christ who lives within me. I live and move and have my being in him, in Jesus the Lord. Now, the, there's not a divorce between love and knowledge. Every now and then, uh, somebody, who, 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 a dissident will say to me, oh, we don't have to have all that head knowledge. We, just, God doesn't care about that. All you gotta do is love and do whatever you want. Happy horse manure. In plain English, there is no contradiction between love and truth. Love and truth are names for God. And there's only one of him, the one God who is the truth, who is love. If you love the Lord your God with your whole heart, mind, and strength, then you ought to want to know something about them. How can you be in love with somebody if you don't even care to know about them? That's absurd. You're just whistling Dixie if you say you love God and don't want to know anything about them. And to know your faith is to know God because that's what the faith is. The doctrine of the faith isn't some book of abstractions. The doctrine of the faith is Jesus Christ. All the words in the Bible, all the words in the Catechism of the Catholic Church, all the words in our religion can be condensed, synthesized, and distilled into one word, the eternal word, and his name is Jesus, the Lord. That's the bottom line. So what do we have in the Catholic Church? We got Jesus Christ. Now, what does that mean, though? Oh, it, 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 it's so deep. It, it's everything. It's everything. The Alpha and the Omega, the first, the last, the beginning and the end. Jesus, the Son of, the, of our Heavenly Father. His only word, Jesus. In the eternal silences of the Trinity, God our Father spoke but one word. His only word. Jesus. He has no more to say. Those are the words of the great doctor of the church, St. John of the Cross. One word, Jesus. What do we have in the Catholic Church? We have the fullness of Jesus Christ. We don't have a diminished version of Jesus. We don't have a distorted version of Jesus. We have the full. Jesus Christ. What do I mean by that? I mean we have the fullness of divine revelation. Now you're all good Catholics, but you could be better. You know, I say that to myself. I try to be a good priest, good Catholic, but I could be better. I know that. And I have to keep trying to be better. You know, ne never, never sit back and think you've arrived. Let me tell you when you've arrived. You've arrived when you get to heaven. Everybody, everybody else is on the way. You haven't arrived until you get to the destination. And that's heaven. Everybody else is a wayfarer, a pilgrim. We're all work in process. And so be all you can be. Be the best you can be. Let me tell you something. I, I don't, I can't, I try not to criticize the rest of the world, although I do it now and then. But I try not to do too much, but I sure enough criticize us. The mess out there is because of the mess in here. The mess out there in the world is because of the mess in the Catholic Church. Why? We have failed. 
to be everything we are called to be. Be all you can be, one person at a time. One person at a time. We're real good, and me included, me included. We're good at criticizing. You know, we look at, oh, the president should have done that, and, and the bishop should have done that, and the pastor should have done that, and the parent should have done the other thing. We're very good at criticizing. Rather, we should turn our gaze within and say, I should have done that. You know what? You know why the world's a stinking mess? Because I have failed to be as holy as I am called to be. Bottom line, I don't have any control over anybody else. I got to deal with me. I got to deal with me. One person at a time, we must be perfected as our Heavenly Father is perfect. That's, that's what Jesus said. Those are the exact words of Jesus Christ. You must be, well, there's two Gospels, two different versions. You must be perfected as your Heavenly Father is perfect. I like that one better. And the other one says you must be perfect as your Heavenly Father is perfect. Well, I know I'm not perfect. You may say that, no, I'm not perfect. Of course not. I, that's why I like the other version. It says you must be perfected. In other words, I'm on the way. I haven't yet arrived. I, I got hope, man. I'm moving towards my destiny, perfection in God, the beatific vision. The reason we got a mess in the world is Catholics sit on the big fat backside and don't do anything. Man, you better be praying like your life depends on it because it does. We have entered into perilous times. The world is poised on the edge of a precipice, about to fall off. Evil is having its hour, but the day of the Lord is close at hand. And so you gotta be ready. Know what you have in the Catholic Church. Two things, two ways to approach this. The two primary faculties or elements which make a human being what they are, specifically human, are intellect and will. That's what makes us in the image and likeness of God. Intellect and will. The proper object of the intellect is truth. That's what the intellect's made for, truth. And your, your intellect, your mind, cannot rest, cannot find peace until it rests in the truth. And the truth is Jesus Christ. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Well, that's what your mind is made for. Your mind is made for God. And you will not rest. You will not have peace. You will be restless, lacking peace, until your mind rests in God. And you can't go to God except through Jesus Christ. That's the only authentic and, a, and absolute way to approach God. That's the way he gave us. No one goes to the Father, Jesus said. No one goes to the Father except through the Son. No one knows the Father except the Son and those whom the Son reveals the Father to. So the mind is made for truth. What's the truth, God? And then the other major faculty of a human being that makes us in the image and likeness of God is the will. The will. And what's the, what's the will made for? The will's made for the good. Mind's made for truth. The will is made for the good. Those are names for God. God is the good. God is the truth. And so our will's made for God. And your will, your free will, that will will be restless until it rests in God. You can't truly be happy until you're rooted in God. How do we satisfy those things, though? The truth. You know, if I say, well, what is the truth? You ask a million people what the truth is, and you're going to get a million different answers. But we know. And the point of departure is the truth isn't something. The truth is somebody. You see, God is the truth. Now, we see God through Jesus Christ. 
You look at Jesus if you want to see God. If you want to begin to understand the unfathomable mystery of God, you've got to look at Jesus. He's true God. And he's also true man. If you want to begin to <clears throat> understand <clears throat> your own mysterious human nature, you've got to look at Jesus. Because he's not only true God, he's true man. I say he's true man because his humanity is not diminished or distorted by sin. No sin in Jesus. He's truly God and truly human. And so the truth, well you begin with, with the truth is God. All truth that truly is subsists in him who is the truth. God. All right. How do you know what the truth is? People have all kinds of ideas about Jesus Christ. How do you know what that truth is? Well, God revealed it to us. How did, how did God reveal the truth to us? Well, he revealed the truth to us in the person of his son. Now, how is that transmitted to us, though? How's the knowledge of, the, that, the, the, of Jesus, how's that transmitted to us? How do we know Jesus in a human way? There's three ways. And, and once again, this is fundamental. This is fundamental, but the average Catholic, if I put it in a simple question on the exam, won't get it. Okay, I'll ask the question. Maybe you'll get it, or some will get it. If I say, what are the three ways, the, the three major ways that God transmits his revelation to us? sacred scripture a lot of people get that the second sacred tradition and the third magisterial teaching no one of which can subsist without the other two now one catholic in a hundred thousand would know that but it's basic it's basic why don't we know it it hasn't been taught uh, two different things number one most people aren't interested. The average Catholic doesn't go to church on Sunday. One out of five Catholics in North America even bothers to go to church on Sunday. And that's a precept. You got to do that. That's an obligation. So, so am I to expect they're going to enter into a study of their faith? No, they don't. And that's why we have a mess in the world, because we fail miserably in our Catholic vocation. We fail miserably. If the Catholic Church was a military unit, it would have been overrun and wiped out long ago. If it were a football team, it would have lost every game. If it were a corporation, it'd be bankrupt. Why? Because the members have not taken their faith seriously. Now you people have. You're a remnant. You're good people. You're very important. You, you have no idea how important you are. You really are. I'm telling you, the, the, the fate of the world is in your hands. You're like the remnant of Israel. You know, you're, 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 you're David fighting Goliath. But you know, it's easy to fight a war when you know the ultimate outcome. And here's the out ultimate outcome. We win. We win. You know, if you're going to play in the Super Bowl, I bet it'd be a lot easier if you knew you were going to win. If you're in the heavyweight championship fight, it'd be a lot easier to step in the ring if you knew the outcome. You're going to win. You're going to be victorious. Well, that's a guarantee. We win. Jesus won this battle on the cross. So we win. However, and this is the punchline, however, we have to accept the victory. And that plays out in the life of of every human being. We can either accept the victory or reject the victory. We can either accept the truth or reject the truth. We can either accept the good 
or reject the good. Now, unfortunately, we have something at work within us called sin. That's a reality. A fight goes on inside every human being between good and evil, truth and lies, light and darkness, life and death. The ultimate outcome, heaven or hell. Now, it all comes down to that. All the talk and theology and religion, it, it, it really pales into utter insignificance when you come up against that one irrefutable fact. What it all boils down to, in the end, is you're going to be in heaven or in hell forever. Now, the average weak-kneed, spineless person of the 21st century in this culture can't take straight talk. Don't like it. Ugh, fire and brimstone. I don't like the way he talks. Yeah, well, you can't deny it, though. It's the truth, and you're not going to get away from it. At the end, every one of us is going to die. Man, most Catholic audiences, when I come, I look out and say, yeah, and from the looks of it, pretty soon for some of you. <laughs> you ain't getting any younger. And neither am I. But you don't have to worry. If you write with God, you're right. But that's the bottom line. Heaven, hell. As the Bible says, two ways are set before you, O man. The way of life and the way of death. And that's the bottom line. Two ways. We got a choice. Good, evil, truth, lies, light, darkness, life, death, heaven, hell, period, exclamation point. That's all there is to it. It ain't rocket science. It's very simple. The knowledge is simple. I think the real problem is in the will. Well, we've got help for that too. Now, for the intellect, we have the truth. We have the fullness of divine revelation in the Catholic Church, but the average Catholic doesn't know it. The average Catholic couldn't even give you a definition of divine revelation. If I ask you what sacred scripture is, you could tell me that. You say, well, that's, that's the Bible. Right, you're right, good. What about sacred tradition? Capital T, what is sacred tradition? Ah, but 99.9% .9 of Catholics don't know it. You want to know how important sacred tradition is? It's equal with sacred scripture in the Catholic Church. And the average Catholic doesn't even know what it is. What is it? Jesus never wrote a book when he walked the face of the earth. Oh, the Bible has God as its primary author. Be sure of that. And that's one of the ways God transmits his revelation to us is through the Bible. Absolutely. Ought to love the Bible, read the Bible, live what's in the Bible. Equal, equal to sacred scripture is sacred tradition. Now, what is it? Basically, in a nutshell, sacred tradition. And I'm not talking about customs here. Sacred tradition, capital T, the apostolic kerygma. That's the oral teaching of Jesus Christ, the sum and substance of what Jesus did and taught, orally. Jesus didn't teach through a book. He taught orally. He preached. He taught by word of mouth. The substance of that teaching in faith and morals, which he gave primarily to his apostles, who had a special gift to hand that on to the rest of the church, that oral teaching Jesus himself gave to the apostles is sacred tradition, the substance of the, of the doctrine of the faith, what we believe in faith and moral, sacred tradition. But you know, wherever you have a word, we're talking about the word of God here, 
how the Word of God is transmitted. Wherever you have a word, whether written or spoken, you have to have an authoritative and authentic interpreter of that word. Otherwise, that word is going to be subject to as many interpretations as there are people interpreting it. That's human nature. And God knows that. And so God gave us in the church a teaching body, uh, the magisterium of the church. And you, you can't have sacred tradition or sacred scripture without the magisterium of the church. You know, I ask people, well, where do you, where do you think the Bible came from? You know, I mean, it didn't drop out of the sky. You know, an angel didn't show up one day and said, oh, here's a book from God. Where did it come from? Again, the church. The bishops united to the Bishop of Rome, the Pope. They decided what would be in the Bible after examining prayerfully the various documents, the various codexes, the, the various scrolls and so forth. The church decided what would go into the Bible in the first place. Way back, way back before the 16th century of the Reformation so-called, you, you have three elements. Now God, we know that, let me give it to you. I'm gonna do this in the, in the next hour more fully this afternoon. I don't want to get too far down the road, but, but three things. Sacred tradition, sacred scripture, magisterial teaching, no one of which can subsist without the other two. Analogy, the Trinity. How many gods are there? One. One God. That one God, how many persons in that one God? Three persons in that one God. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Now, if your concept of God is other than that, your concept of God is faulty not in accordance with objective reality. There's one God, three divine persons. That's a fact. And somebody says, I don't believe that. Fine. Fine. Don't believe it. You know, let, let me tell you something. In, in this discussion of people leaving the church, uh, and what we have, let, let me tell you something I learned a long time ago. You can't force anybody to do anything. I don't argue with people. I, you know, I'm not like an apologist. or I don't argue. I don't get involved in polemics. I preach from a position of authority. Who gave me the authority? The church gave me the authority. Now, you don't have to believe what I say because of anything me personal. No, but you, you gotta believe the doctrine of the faith and that's what I'm giving you here. This is what we believe. And what we believe is not fuzzy. What we believe is not gray and subject to all kind of human interpretation. What we believe is absolute and objective. The church knows exactly what she believes. The problem is people who mess around with that. The church's teaching is not fuzzy. The church's teaching is solid. And so here's what my job and yours is. Hand on that teaching. Don't mess with it. Don't mess around with the doctrine of the faith Receive it clearly and give it clearly. Say yes when you mean yes and no when you mean no, Jesus says. All else is from the evil one. That's a direct quote from Jesus Christ. Say yes when you mean yes and no when you mean no. All else is from the evil one. The moral teaching of the church isn't fuzzy, indeterminate, lacking in moral absolutes. Oh, it is absolute. There is good and there is evil. Well, but there are exceptions to that. No. Well, uh, you're saying that I can't have a relationship with my significant other? Man, in the beginning, when God created everything out of nothing, and he got to humanity, male and female, he created them. It ain't Adam and Steve in plain English. It's Adam and Eve. And I don't have a better idea than God. That's the way it is. 
Don't try to mess with that. Don't water that, that down. Don't try to call the truth a lie and lies the truth. It is what it is. We got to know what we have in the Catholic Church. Know what you have in terms of the doctrine of the faith. Man, oh man, you know, we, we have absolute certainty concerning what we believe. It, it's not questionable. I mean, it's not questionable what the Ten Commandments are. I guarantee you there will not be a new revelation one day that tells you there's 14 commandments. There will always be ten, and there will always be seven sacraments. Listen, the truth, the doctrine of the faith, what the Catholic Church teaches, that's what your intellect needs. That's the truth. You get into that, and your mind will begin to have peace. And, but, you know, I think the intellect, big a problem as it is, isn't the biggest problem. The biggest problem is in the will. I have often said, Many of us know more than enough to be canonized saints. Unfortunately, no saint was ever canonized for what he knew. No saint was ever canonized for what he knew. Saints are canonized for what they do. Heroic virtue. The real problem's in the will. You can instruct a person very well, and that truth will help illumine their mind. And so they know everything they're supposed to do. Man, they know the Ten Commandments up one side and down the other. They know the doctrine of the faith. They know everything the church teaches, and then they don't do it. Why? Well, it's in the will. There's a struggle. There's a fight that goes on. You know, people have repeatedly said to me, the Catholic faith is too hard, man. You, uh, you're requiring too, too much. That's too much. Uh, nobody can do that. Uh, you're right. You're right. For man, it is impossible. But for God, all things are possible. What they leave out is a very important factor called grace. Left to his own devices without grace, man cannot achieve his supernatural end, which is eternal beatitude. You need sanctifying grace. And, 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 but in the Catholic Church, do we know what we have? Well, maybe yes, maybe no. Let me remind you if you've forgotten. In the Catholic Church, we have seven sacraments. Nobody else has that. The other Christian denominations have two sacraments, two valid sacraments, baptism, matrimony. The other five sacraments they do not have. Do you know why? Because they don't have a valid ministerial priesthood. No apostolic succession. Five of the seven sacraments require a valid ministerial priesthood. Why? Because God did it that way. You know, somebody said, well, I don't understand that. How, how come? Uh, you know, a lot of things an educated, a truly educated person who's in touch with reality, the most common answer you have to give is, now read my lips, I don't know. You know, that, that's, for some reason, that's so hard for, for educated people. To do. We don't know everything, but we know certain things. You know, I, I can speak a long time about what we know, but frequently you'll come up against uh, questions or things, and I've got to say, I don't know. You know, uh, Bishop Sheen one time was preaching out west. I think he was at UCLA or some major university out there. And he was talking about Jonah being in the belly of the whale for three days. And some heckler, a wise guy, and they go, oh, he's got to be one. Says, well, how do you know Jonah was in the belly of the whale for three days? And Bishop Sheen, you know, he, the answer is he didn't know. Bishop Sheen says, well, when I get to heaven, I shall ask him. And the heckler said, yeah, well, what if he isn't there? And he said, well, then you ask him.
So, you know, sometimes we got to say we don't know. But, seven sacraments. God gave us seven sacraments. That means we must need seven sacraments. God doesn't do useless things. We, if he gave us seven, we need seven. Five of the seven require a valid ministerial priesthood. What do the sacraments do for us? They give us sanctifying grace. Well, what's that all about? It's about life. It's about supernatural life. You can't live in God without sanctifying grace. Sanctifying grace is a share in divine life. So when I ask you this afternoon on the exam question, now, and, and I'm one of those teachers, I'm an easy teacher. You, you know, you, you could never accuse me of being unfair. I'm one of those teachers who gives you all the answers before the exam. Didn't you love them kind of teachers? They give you all, all the answers, and, and they say, oh, here's, the, here's what it is. They give you everything in advance. Then when the, then it, you've got nothing to complain about. You get the exam, they ask a question. They've already given the answer to you previously. You got no excuse. You were asleep. You weren't studying. But, but no excuse, sir. You know, you flunk. What is sanctifying grace? Sanctifying grace is a share in divine life. That's the short, sweet, simple answer. That isn't rocket science. You can say that. You can remember that. And that'll help you. You know, we, ha we have to memorize certain things. Now, I know memorization is the bane of most of our existence. We don't like to do it. You know, in school, oh man, I gotta memorize, oh, I gotta memorize all this, I can't do that, I get a headache. Can you imagine, now my friend Charlie Vianney is probably here, and he, Charlie's an engineer, and uh, it, it, can you, I, if Charlie went through his university studies, and, and they were teaching him some physics, or some mathematics, and can you imagine Charlie, an engineering student, say, ah, geez, uh, physics, those, 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 those formulas, they give me a headache. Those, those mathematical formulas, they want me to learn that stuff. I, I, I'm not going to do that. I'm not driving over his bridge. <laughs> or, 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 the, or, or the cardiologist who says, in, in school, he's going through his medical studies, and, and, he, and he, comes to the, he comes to the classes on anatomy. And, and, and he's got to memorize all the parts of the body and how they interact. And, and he says, oh, Jesus gives me a headache. I can't memorize all this stuff. And so he, he cuts class for all his anatomy classes. He ain't doing no triple bypass on me. <laughs> Common sense. We got to memorize certain things, or else how are you going to know anything? Outcome based. Education, whatever it is, religion or mathematics or English or history, you just got a body of knowledge and you got to learn it. And the only way to find out if you learned it is to get tested on it. Man, I sat through more tests in my life. 12 years almost, 12 years of university level education, and I never really liked school. <laughs> but man, I had a bunch of it. Exam after exam, the, the culmination of course was in Europe and, and when I did my doctoral studies. They have a medieval process there. The exam at the bachelor level, the licentiate or master's level, and the doctoral level, each one's exceedingly more difficult. The, you have oral exams. You have written exams, too. But then you have oral exams. You have a body of knowledge you're responsible for. Let's say at the, at, at the doctoral level. And they'll, have, they'll take 100 questions, which will encapsulate and synthesize the entire body of knowledge that you are responsible for. 100 questions. Then you've got to study that. You've got to know that body of knowledge. And then at the exam, and oh, it's in a big room like this, the Aula Magna. And the whole university turns out for this. And you get up there in front of the whole university, and there's five professors seated on the dais, way above you, and you're a little peon down here. And they're way up there, and it's very intimidating, and the whole university 
is sitting there. And they bring in this bag filled with wooden balls, a hundred of them, about the size of golf balls. And they're numbered one to a hundred. And you reach in there and you take one out. Ah, number 42. And that corresponds to the question number 42. You go out of the room for five minutes. You got five minutes to make some hurried notes. Then you come in and you give a one hour lecture on that topic. And then the professors have an hour to cross examine you. That's how you find out if somebody knows anything. You examine them. And that's how you determine competence in that area. And you can't, I'm not saying it's the only way, but it's one essential way. They've got to know it. We've got to know our faith. And then live our faith. Know it, live it. Know it, the intellect, truth. Live it, the will, the good. And that's where the sacraments come in. That's how they help. Why? They give us power. Another way of expressing the sacraments, uh, they're conduits which bring sanctifying grace to us. Conduits, channels, which bring us sanctifying grace, life. They bring us divine life. No sanctifying grace, no, no supernatural life. That's what strengthens the will. That, that's what enables us to live as we know we should. That's what we have in the Catholic Church. No other church has that. Nobody else has that. Now, the Eastern Rites, the Greek Orthodox, the Russian Orthodox, they have it. They have seven valid sacraments like we do. But the other Christian denomination don't have, they don't have five of the seven. They don't have five of the ways sanctifying grace comes to us. That's what we have in the Catholic Church. You need to know that. That knowledge will illumine your intellect. It'll give you light to see in the dark. And then those sacraments, that'll strengthen your will. This is not easy. The Catholic Church teaches that life, human existence, is the story of dour combat with the forces of evil. Dour combat with the forces of evil. That's what life is. And today, more than ever, we need all the help we can get. I don't know about you, but I need all the help I can get. I, I need all the sacraments working in my life. You say, well, not, uh, what about matrimony? You can't have that sacrament. Right, but you do. And that helps me. Why? When you live your married life faithfully, that brings grace not just on you and your family, but into all the church, including me. When you live your married life the way you should, you help priests. And when we priests live our priestly life the way we should, we help you. See, we're, we're in this together. We are in this dour combat together. I need you. I do. And you need me. We're in it together. This is a fight to the death. This is a knockdown, drag out, bare knuckles brawl with the forces of evil. Our mind needs to be illuminated by the light of truth, and our will needs to be strengthened by the power of grace. That is what we have in the Catholic Church. And we have a lot of other stuff, too. We have the Blessed Mother. And, and I could go on a long time about her. We've got the Blessed Mother in this combat with evil. Now, I've often said it. The first time I ever said it was at the University of Notre Dame. And just in the course of my preaching on the Blessed Mother, I said, your mama wears combat boots. And that's no insult. Our mama does wear combat boots. You ever see the pictures of the statues of the Blessed Mother crushing the head of the serpent? You better believe she's wearing some combat boots. Our lady is a warrior. 
tremendous worry, leading the fight against evil. How did she get the position? Her son gave it to her. Why? Because he wanted to. And when I get to heaven, I'll ask him. <laughs> we, we, <laughs> so you see, we have so much in the Catholic Church. We have the fullness of divine revelation in scripture, tradition, and magisterial teaching. We have everything we need, the full means of salvation to strengthen our will. Seven sacraments, not just one or two, seven. We have every one God gave to strengthen our will, help us fight the good fight. We have the Blessed Mother, we have the angels and the saints. Man, oh man, what a rich legacy we have received. And yet, the average Catholic couldn't hold forth on this for two minutes, much less give an hour dissertation on any of it, you'd say, well, we don't have to have a doctorate degree in theology. You're right, you don't. That's not necessary. All you have to have is a fundamental knowledge of your faith. If every Catholic, now think about this, if every Catholic would have a fundamental, clear understanding of their faith and then receive the sacraments in a state of grace, reverently and then live their lives in accordance with what they know and the power they have oh what a different world this would be oh what a different country this would be well we have our marching orders we have orders from headquarters be all you can be be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect Say, I can't do that. Oh, yes, you can. Jesus said that we must, and he doesn't give us an impossible order, one step at a time. The longest journey still requires that the first step be taken. So take the step. Learn your faith. Learn that catechism of the Catholic Church. Uh, get it and read it. And then watch my series or get the DVDs or CDs, whatever it takes. Learn your faith. That's not the only way to learn it. You do, whatever works for you, use that. But don't just sit there. If you're 8 or 80, you can learn, you can advance in your knowledge of the faith. Maybe you never really got it. You say, oh, one guy said, Father, I can't read. I said, well, do you watch television? He said, yeah. And we were talking about learning the faith, you know. And he said, oh, I can't read that catechism, you know. I never really learned how to read very good. I said, you watch television? Yup, okay. Turn it on. 8 o'clock Eastern Time, Sunday night. And you'll see, it's been on for 10 years. Man, they play episode 1 through 50, and then they start episode 1 again. Non-stop, it's been going on for 10 years. Hundreds of thousands of people have learned their faith better because they just sat there in the comfort of their living room and listened attentively and learned their faith. Illumined the inland. And then when they received the sacraments, they were more open and they were strengthened and you can march right into the very teeth of death without any fear. We've been called upon to mount an assault against the very gates of hell. And in order to do that, you better be strong. You better be solid in your faith, fearless. Fear is useless, Jesus said. Fear is useless. What is needed is trust. So trust him. Learn your faith, receive the sacraments, be all you can be as a Catholic. Know what we have. Know what you have and then live it with all your might and then other people will see that and they too will be attracted to that great blessing called the Catholic Church. God love you.